then you can work on your Okay, so as Professor François Maréchal already told you, um, uh, so merci Monsieur aussi, I uh, have a chemical engineering background. I did here at the PFL. Uh, I did my minor in energy, so I did advanced energetics as you. And then I continue on my PhD on uh, thermal efficiency on the different uh, um, chemical sites. Today I'm going to present you a bit the situation, the current situation of the chemical and petrochemical industry. So petrochemical industry, this is the way I put that word, in Europe, and also the importance of energy efficiency. And on the second part of the presentation, I will uh, briefly present the type of projects uh, that are offered at our sites. So the first part of the presentation, as I said, uh, the importance of energy efficiency in the chemical and petrochemical industry. First of all, I uh, will briefly present the, the petrochemical sector. So probably you know, but it's always good to have a bit of a, of a refresh on it, and sometimes we think that we know, but we don't really know. Uh, so the chemical industry basically converts raw material like crude oil and natural gas, but also water, air, and uh, metals and minerals for the inorganic chemistry into more than 70,000 products. And uh, despite the fact that it's quite complex, um, there are mainly seven primary chemicals that are the building blocks for the, for the rest of the chemical industry. And those building blocks are ethylene, propylene, benzene, toluene, xylene, methanol, and also ammonia, which is not displayed on this chart. Um, basically, 95% 95, 95 of the manufactured goods are using a product that is derived from those chemicals. Uh, these chemicals, as I said, they're originating from crude oil and natural gas. Crude oil are processed, or is processed in refinery. Uh, so that it's cut into the different fractions and the lighter fraction that are naphtha and also uh, LPG for liquefied petroleum gas are then processed into the petrochemical industry to produce barrel use petrochemicals that are then used into end use products that you use every day. So nowadays, nowadays it's hardly a day goes by and then we do not use a, a product that is coming from petrochemistry, whether it is the clothes that you wear sport clothes, equipment, you we love that. Uh, of course, also food and, uh, and beverages packaging, but also paints, uh, tires, uh, really a lot of things, pharmaceuticals. You can see also here, um, in a, let's say, uh, more sustainable future, we have more renewables, but the materials that are used in the wind turbines or also in solar panels are also using petrochemicals, uh, application in batteries, tires, uh, luggage, better insulation for um, more efficient uh, houses and buildings, light materials for cars, whatever, you, you, you see that. So it's not only uh, plastic bottles, that's what I want to say. Um, so to produce these uh, all those chemicals, you have a manufacturing site. This site is processing feedstock or reactants into products. To do that, you need energy and it produces waste. So to um, the goal is for sure to minimize the energy that you input into your system and also minimize the waste for the same uh, amount of uh, product that you, useful product that you produce. And in Europe, the current policy and regulatory framework is acting on that on several levels. So first of all, Europe really defined, uh, it, Europe is really the continent where you have the more stringent regulations in terms of um, CO2 emissions and uh, energy consumptions. Uh, this goes along with this uh, strategy and roadmap for a low carbon uh, economy, putting a uh, high emphasis also on circular economy. So these are the tar targets that were defined already back in 2007, the first targets were defined for 2020. So 20% a reduction in energy consumption or increase in energy efficiency, 20% share of renewable energies in the mix, and 20% reduction uh, in green of greenhouse gases uh, emissions. More recently, the targets for 2030 uh, have been defined. You can see a sharp increase, 32.5 for energy efficiency, 32 for renewable energies, and 44 greenhouse gas emission. All of these to pave, to pave the way for 2050 with a major ambition of reduction for CO2 emissions of 80 to 85%. So all of this will be 
ensured or pushed by several uh, um, regulations in terms of uh, directives. So for example, uh, here you have the Industrial Emission Directive that basically define best practices of the different sectors. So these are, these are called the BREFs. They're defining the acceptable limit for, uh, for the waste, for the emissions that have to be met in order to be allowed to operate. So if a site doesn't uh, fulfill the requirements, then it cannot operate. We have also the famous emission trading scheme for the CO2 emissions uh, that are covering the, the large uh, and energy intensive industries in, in Europe that basically set a certain amount of emission for a phase. And uh, this amount of emission is reduced for each phase, forcing the, 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 the industry to, to act on it and reduce the emissions. And finally, that's what also is important for energy efficiency, uh, you have the Energy Efficiency Directive, which uh, um, imposes regular energy audits for the, for the, for the industry every four years, or uh, the implementation of an energy management system, driving also the effort to make the investment and to do things to improve uh, our way of operations. So, energy efficiency. Uh, although we, the, the energy efficiency of the industrial sector really improved since 2000. I think 15% is the number, but there is still a potential uh, for, for improvement, so that's why also uh, I'm here today. And if you see here, so this graph is taken from the International Energy Agency report of this year uh, on the outlook for 2040 for uh, energy efficiency. And you can see that the blue line is the uh, forecasted uh, emissions of CO2 if we take into account the policies that are implemented in the countries or will be implemented in the countries that, that signed the Paris Agreement. So you can see that it's keep, it keeps increasing, so in a way we can meet the target. And this uh, green scenario is actually policies, additional policies that should be uh, added regarding different type, type of technologies which would enable to reach the, the target that, that we want. And you can see that, uh, that energy efficiency is responsible for the, for the largest share, let's say, with 44%. So it's, it's not only industry, it's also, also buildings and transport, yes? So I understand well, what you are planning here is to decrease actually the energy production by... This is CO2 emissions. emissions. Ah, CO2 emissions. Yeah, sorry, it's, not, yeah, it's a gigaton of... Uh, so this, also, this slide also uh, shows the, the importance of energy efficiency. So you have here the time scale since 2000, 2016, and the blue curve is the actual, uh, uh, this, this, this time is energy, is the actual energy consumption. So this is for the three sectors, buildings, transport, and industry. With efficiency and without efficiency, it would have been here, and here you have the contribution of the different sector. In green, it's building, in orange, it's transport, and in purple, it's industry. Uh, so to say the, the importance of energy efficiency still today. And it's going to be in the future because, because even if you find new processes that are alternative to what is currently done, you want to be as efficient as you can. A few words on Ineos now. Uh, so Ineos is a global manufacturer for petrochemicals, specialty chemicals, and also oil products. Um, we are, um, it comprises, I think, 34 different businesses uh, that are all having a major chemical uh, heritage. You can see that it's uh, previous sites from BASF, Bayer, uh, Dow, Innovin, ICI. Uh, the, we have 175, uh, 71 sites in 24 countries around the world, but most of the sites are located in Europe. Uh, you can see here the, the spread, uh, the geographic spread. So we have also a few things in USA, Canada, and in Asia. But most of the, uh, of the production is really in Europe compared to other companies or other sectors. So those regulations that I mentioned apply to us and are of a really big importance. So we are doing things, uh, many things on site, but also active on uh, research and innovation with uh, partnership, partnerships with academia. For example, uh, funded PhD thesis, so I was one of them. First of all, they started with osmosis in two, that ended in 2016. I was a uh, former colleague of mine working on also on uh, energy efficiency, but most, mo more on the steam network level. Then I followed with Osmo 6, <coughs> dealing with energy efficiency and energy auditing of the whole plants, mostly with the uh, thermal power, because we consume also electricity, but in a lower amount compared to fuels and steam. 
But energy efficiency is one thing, but we're also involved in two other types of projects. So for example, the EPOS project, it includes resources as well. So uh, it's really energy and resources efficiency at, uh, across different sectors. So the collaboration between petrochemistry and chemistry, but also cement, uh, steel, and uh, finding really synergies between the different type of sectors. Uh, COPRO, which is uh, looking at resources and uh, energy efficiency by better coordination of all production. Alessio is actually working on that project. Uh, other type of project is Elegancy, uh, with, uh, which, which deals with uh, carbon capture usage and um, sequestration, coupled with uh, hydrogen production. And also coming project that we apply to, like Flex, also dealing with carbon capture and storage, and Vesta, which is uh, dealing with uh, developing a software for better control and monitoring of the energy consumption of sites. And na other national projects. So as you can see, we're quite involved into uh, research and innovation projects because I think those are exciting times and we need to find solutions all together. Which brings me to uh, the typical energy studies or the typical projects that we offer at our sites. So the goal of the, those, the, those projects basically is, so you have a site, so this is, well, I, I've, I've taken a big site, it's one of our uh, big petrochemical cluster in, in Cologne, so really complex and integrated system. We have other sites that, are, that have this size, but sometimes it's mostly one, two process units with a utility system, which is embedded into a larger cluster also, but with different companies. Here, it's, a lot of it is, is really in use. So to produce all, all of our chemicals, uh, we need for sure energy. So the main type of, let's say, uh, utilities that are consumed are fuels, steam, and electricity. Also, sometimes fuel is just burned to produce steam. So, so sometimes those steam is imported. This is really to support the production. These are the hot utilities. And then for cooling, we have air cooling, water, and also refrigeration, basically using electricity. And the goal of the energy studies are basically to, to find ways to reduce energy consumption of the site, also reducing the CO2 emission, of course, and bringing additional advantage like waste reduction and so on. Uh, and as a number, I didn't put it in the slides, but I think our energy bill for last year was like 1.8 billion euro or something. So for sure costs are a driver, <laughs> is a driver as well. Um, so on these slides are summarized the key objectives of the, of the energy study that we propose. Uh, additional objectives are varying depending on the site's characteristic. So basically the goal is to do a site energy review uh, that means taking the site by site's boundaries, the fuels that we consume, the different products that are uh, processed, and then the waste, and detail the mass and energy balances. So detail really what's going on, why do we use energy in the first place? Um, typically what you do also on, on your project, but in a more complex way, in real way, let's say. And from this analysis, mass and energy balances, you come up with the site energy profile by uh, deriving the the, pro the profile of, uh, of the heating and the cooling, and then you obtain this composite curve, and, the, and from those two steps, the goal is to derive a list of energy savings opportunities in the right way, and evaluate this uh, thermoeconomically. But it's not a really deep analysis, because we don't necessarily have the tools to, and the time to analyze it properly, but it's, also, it's really to give the sites uh, let's say a, a way to start from, a, not a list to start from, but uh, the list of, of options. These are the main steps. Uh, so the first, uh, the first site energy review is detailed here, not necessarily the second part. So basically, this, I can tell you, this is going to take a while, data gathering and validation, because you have data that you're looking for is, is disseminated into different sources, it can be process and instrumentation diagrams, users' manuals, interviews with operators, uh, many, many different things. And also, the balances will not match at the beginning, so it's up to you also to uh, find ways to ensure that you're working with a, validate, a set of validated data. It's also important to identify losses and so on. Uh, identify accurately those losses. Uh, then, once you have a good set of data, the goal is really to look at the entire energy chain, from the energy conversion, distribution, to end-use consumption, where you will apply the pinch analysis. It helps also uh, uh, to develop key performance indicators, for example, the amount of energy that is used to process uh, the certain amount of goods can be done at the plant level, but also at the subpart level or equipment level, so that you can see really, okay, 
uh, I can see the trend, the best, the best trend, the best, uh, let's say, operation, and I would recommend this for the plant. All of this sort of information. So going back to the site energy review, there is several level of details to represent the site. So the goal of this first step is really to do a top-down analysis on the energy consumption. So your site looks like this. The goal really is first to define what is this boundary with the reactants in your products and the energy vectors and the waste I said. I put also here the cooling. The goal is really to understand why do we consume this energy in the first place. So we want to have a look inside on the second view, which is called the side view. So here, basically, we detail the main blocks of the system. So, of course, you will have the process units, but for those process units, you need energy and it has to be distributed. And you also have uh, production support. Uh, this energy can be, uh, well, usually it's uh, fuel, natural gas and, uh, and steam. Fuel is usually burnt, producing steam. It is distributed to be used by the process unit, but those units can be also exothermic. So basically, they can release heat, and this can be recovered as, as part of steam. Steam is also distributed to workshops, offices, production supports, also flaring. And uh, natural gas can also be burned directly. It's not, it's not shown here, but it can be burned directly on furnaces if, if you want to reach high temperature. And on the other side, you have the cooling, which is also distributed, and that cools down the process. You have also cogeneration, whether it is on a CHP or in a uh, back pressure steam turbine within the steam network that produces that produce electricity. So, that's the second level of detail, but then we would like to see also well, it's the process units that are uh, ah, okay, here is the boiler steam network process unit. We want to know also okay what's happening here because this is where the most energy is consumed. So the third level of detail is called the block flow diagram and basically it decomposes the the plant into the, the main building blocks. So usually it's pretty much always the same. We have a reactant preparation mixing with some recyclers coming from the process a reaction that is usually exothermic, as I said, but it can also require heat. Then uh, there is perhaps some reactants that are still there, so we would like to recycle it at the beginning to minimize the, to, to uh, optimize the separation then, which is usually the final step with all those big distillation columns that you can see on the, on the on chemical and petrochemical sites. This is a major uh, energy consumer for sure, because you want to uh, separate your products by their boiling point, so obviously you heat up your uh, distillation color. So usually the level of detail that is required for the energy study uh, this is this level of detail because what we want to do is to stop at the interface between process and the utility system because there is already uh, a certain level of process integration in any plant. I mean, process integration has been developed in the 80s or something like this. So there is already a certain level and for old plants, it's, already re it's often really complicated and costly to modify the existing uh, heat exchanger network, although it's possible. But then often we don't have enough uh, room uh, around the, in the plant because it's quite tight. Uh, sometimes one stream is there, the other is there, because we didn't think about this at the beginning. So this is also uh, to be taken into account. Depending on the, site of this, of this, of the size of the site, however, we can still go into the um, process process detail for some streams. So this is why I put also the last level of detail, which is the complete detail, the process flow sheet, where you can see the, the, the process, for example, process process integration here. So once you've done that and you've identified where energy is used, cold utility, hot utility, the goal is really to apply pinch analysis and obtain those magnificent composite curves. So the goal is really to have, here is the current profile where you can see the, the streams that needs to be heated up, the way they are heat, being heated up. So you have middle pressure steam, low pressure steam, and then you have hot streams that needs to be cooled down, which is basically only carried out these, with the uh, cooling water. This is the system. So the steam is coming from the boiler. We have a turbine that uh, also generates some electricity that is used on site. And you have the condensates. This curve, com uh, ground composite curve, is obtained to use only with only the process stream, so only those profile here. And you can see that this is your ground composite cur curve at the gray box level, so only considering the streams that needs to be cooled cool down and, and heated up. And the goal is, you can see here the hot minimum energy requirement of 25.5 megawatts, and here I've not written it, this is above 30. So the goal is we to find ways to be as close as possible to this particular thing. 
So that's the last step, or well, the second step, let's say. Now we, we're using more a bottom-up approach. So here is an example of an energy maturity matrix. It's all words from energy management system. Usually people look at uh, energy saving opportunities in the wrong way, let's say, starting with housekeeping. So here it's not annotated, but it could be complexity or it could be investment cost. Housekeeping measures are quite easy to implement, usually with a low payback time. It can be related to insulations, uh, better steam traps, uh, anything related to maintenance. Then you have control systems, really to use the equipment that you have in the best way possible, uh, minimize the, the reflux, uh, avoid excess flows, for example. Then you have simple modification, which are related, for example, to replace the motor that is, that is old, or install a variable speed drive, or better um, uh, boiler, for example, with a waste heat recovery boiler with an economizer. Then we have process integration, basically uh, heat recovery, which is, can be direct or indirect. It can also be heat pumping, like you, like you saw today, in mechanical vapor recompression. And the last step, which usually br uh, brings the highest energy savings, reject uh, energy savings, is to uh, consider alternative processes. So maybe switch the uh, distillation columns by a membrane separation, which consumes much less energy. Or uh, instead of your boiler, you invest in a CHP, so you redesign the entire uh, um, way the, the utility is uh, provided to your, uh, to your process. But in this project, the goal is really to look from this to there. So first of all, is also usually it's, it's basically mostly a literature review on what could be done, like what, what is the state of the art in terms of research of the, of the different processes. It's, it's quite common processes, so it's quite easy to find. So this is why usually we started the process operating parameters that you can change. For example, if you play on the pressure on the distillation, maybe you can, you, you, you're able to integrate the condenser with a, with a reboiler really easily. Uh, it can be feed preheating of distillation column, then process heat integration, heat pumping, energy conversion, and then operation control and maintenance. So those basically are the different layers, different types of opportunities that you can look into. And also recommendations on the measurement system, because uh, so, so, so clearly measurements will be missing. So this is an example uh, starting. So Beth, I think it's yeah, it's actually using this a eh, this case study. So the first thing that could have been noticed is the fact that so here is the actual configuration. So you have a distillation column, a feed that is entering at 30 degrees. But in reality, here it's at, I think it's at uh, 90 degrees. And then you have a condenser and a reboiler here, which is using middle pressure steam. In reality, we could preheat the, 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 the feed up to, so this is the pinch point temperature, up to the pinch point temperature using the heat in the condensates, which reduces the, the load of the reboiler. So that's, uh, that's, that's really introducing a new heating requirement in your curve. And it's not easily seen here but you have a reduction of two megawatts of, the, of uh, steam in the, of the reboiler. And this is an actual project, but this is an actual thing that, 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 that were found, that was found, sorry. Then second level, ah, okay. And <laughs> I was mentioning uh, economic analysis. So basically what we're looking for is uh, operating cost savings, but for sure it's, it's the driver, uh, and the, an estimation of the investment cost and the payback time. Then it can be heat integration optimization. So for here you have the initial configuration of the heat exchanger network with two heat exchanger causing a major penalty here 2.7 megawatt and here 2.5 megawatts. So the goal is to a bit redesign and uh, redesign the network so they can remove most of the penalty. This is what is done here. So obviously you need new uh, additional uh, heat exchange area to be able to carry out this heat transfer which comes at a, at a certain cost, but it would allow to recover fine from two megawatts and would pay back time less than three years. Then next layer, heat pumping. Here it's uh, related to mechanical vapor recompression, so using directly a process stream. Here, uh, uh, overhead of a distillation column could be slightly recompressed so that it can heat up the, the reboiler that is using steams. This is already heat integrated to actually save a lot of low pressure steam. And you can see here how it's nicely come up at the top of the, so this is the condensing part at the top and then you have the evaporated part at the bottom. And then last layer is optimized. Uh, so this is just an example, you, have, you can have other opportunities. 
and optimize the utility system. So for now, it's a boiler that is producing the, the, the heat. So you can see here the integrated composite curve. But why not, uh, um, yeah, why not installing a gas, gas turbine and cogenerate co -generate electricity that can be also used uh, in, the, in the side and exported to the grid? <clears throat> so that's my last example for this specific case study. And to, to summarize a bit what we can uh, obtain with those projects, first of all, the aim is to obtain some, something like this, where you have really the, the whole chain from the fuel consumption to the end use uh, at the process unit. So here you have your boiler that can let convert natural gas. You can have also waste fuels coming from the process, your steam, you can generate electricity. You can have also steam from the process, which is coming from the reaction heat and heat that is evacuated to cooling water, maybe hot water that can be exported. There are many, many different scenarios. This is because this is why also is exciting because the definition of the project is the same, but, but then the, um, the site will be different. So that's, that's quite nice. And yeah, I think I've put all the different uh, layers or uh, areas where we look at opportunities. So process optimization and heat recovery, then optimize, once you optimize the process itself, you're looking at what to do with the waste heat, as uh, Professor, Ma Professor Marichal said, with the heat pumping, but also you can find other ways to recover the heat, the, the heat, perhaps district heating, organic ranking cycle. Then once you've optimized this, you look at the best way to provide your hot utility. And this external layer also includes better process control, monitoring, better measurement system that goes along and then industrial symbiosis. What can we, could we do with, with our neighbors? That's it. Uh, the process description is online, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm currently discussing with the people on our, on our sites to see exactly the number of projects that we can offer in the exact location. So that would be for next semester. Probably UK, Belgium and, and Germany, perhaps US, we never know. And uh, yeah, that's it to sum up. Um, so you can see, you could have a better understanding perhaps in the petrochemical industry and the different, uh, and the context and the, and the regulations and the legislations that are currently existing in Europe that are acting on, the, on, on our uh, industrial sector and pushing uh, to uh, be in agreement with the targets. And also to realize how energy efficiency can be a key enabler and I hope that, uh, I don't know, I've uh, triggered some, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know, willingness to, to carry out master projects or internships. Because it can be a master project or an internship, for example, chemical engineer can do, a, or mechanical engineer actually, can do a, an internship uh, in, a, in, a, in a company. So it's, I think it's really, really good to have, as I said, a real in industrial experience and you can really apply what you learn here on, uh, on a real site. That's it. So thank you for your attention. I hope I wasn't too long and uh, that you could learn something. And, uh, have a... and if you have questions, for sure.